today about religious minorities and political participation in the United States. And so one of the things we sort of talk about, uh, or one of the things I'd like to frame this is, is first understanding a little bit about religion in the United States. And so when we think about religion and politics, we often think of what the Constitution of the United States says, which is that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And so we often think that religion and politics are separate, yet that's never really been the case in American politics. And America is very much so a religious nation. It's often the outlier when we look at advanced industrial democracies. And most of this is because we see that the US has what we call a religious marketplace where because there's no established religion as let's say the Church of England or the Lutheran Church or the Orthodox Church in Greece or Russia, you see that essentially all religions act like firms where they compete for customers or, or people to be saved. And so because of this, you see that religions, religions have flourished in the United States. And you see that levels of religi religiosity are higher in the United States. Having said this, religions also become what we call free agents in terms of politics. Whereas in many cases in Europe, where governments had to make concordance or agreements with the Catholic Church, or they've had to deal with a very strong established uh, religious institution, that is not the case in the United States. And so what you've seen is political coalitions from the very beginning, where candidates or parties have coalesced or allied with some of the larger religious denominations there in the country. And so for many years, in fact for centuries, it's the de facto religious establishment could be uh, the Protestants or the Protestant denominations. And what you saw even from the beginning were Episcopalians and Congressionalists that would align, let's say, with John Adams and the Federalists or Baptists and Methodists or Presbyterians who would align with Thomas Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans. So this history of coalitions between denominational groups, primarily within the Protestant traditions, and either candidates or the major political parties is in our history. It's in sort of the makeup of what it means to be American politics. And you see this today in the contemporary era. You see that mainline Protestants, which are shrinking in number, have aligned with the Democratic Party, whereas evangelical Protestants, um, which I have started shrinking in number according to the, uh, some of the last data surveys, have aligned with the Republican Party. And so these alignments, coalitions, alliances, whatever terms you want to use, are still with us today. However, what of religious minority groups? This is a good question. What do we do with these religious minority groups, groups that somewhat fall outside of this de facto established uh, Protestant denominations? Well, the popular narrative in the United States has been that these groups will melt in. Right? This is the melting pot hypothesis, that they all, all just become one big American goulash, right? is what the, I often explain it to the students. Well, that always hasn't been the case, because there's been presence of what we call unmeltables, or groups that simply just won't melt in. And so historically, religious minority groups have had the greatest difficulty in melting in or becoming part of this American fabric. In the colonial times, it was the Baptists and the Quakers who were shoved out to the Appalachian Mountains. And over time, they eventually were able to come in. The Mormons were kicked out of the United States. They literally were said, you will leave. Uh, in fact, one of the most uh, discriminatory laws ever passed against a religious group in the United States have been against the Mormons um, in the 1800s, which we don't think of, right, with Mitt Romney running you know, in, in, in 2012, but historically that's been the case. Adventists as well, um, and uh, in the late 1800s with the Know Nothing Party, as one of the participants mentioned earlier in their um, anti-Catholic stance, anti-Jewish stances in the late 1900s, and currently it's been about Muslims that they can't become Americans, that they can't melt in. And so this is sort of the history of what you see with religious minority groups um, in the United States. But, as I mentioned, over time, you do see that these groups, maybe they don't melt in, maybe we don't quite have the melting pot, maybe we see a salad bowl, and you do see that these groups often do form alliances with political parties. Why is that so? Well, I take sort of a supply and demand argument to try to understand this. First is there's kind of this demand for representation. Does the group actually want to involve itself in politics? Because not all religious minority groups want to. For example, Jehovah Witnesses have no desire. They're apolitical. So they're not going to be involved in, the, in, in politics in, in any country that they're in. They stay out of it completely. So there has to be a desire for them to want to participate. Often that desire can be from political threat. 
A political threat environment is where the group feels like it's threatened because of what political leaders or what the policy makers are doing. So this can spur civic engagement, political participation. Ramakrishnan in his book, uh, Democracy in Immigrant America, makes a very clear case in 2005 and it's been building since. Also policy benefits. Minority groups, some religious minority groups may get involved because they want to be able to help out the homeland or help out their particular group. And so you see this with Jewish American lobbies in the 1920s who are with the Zionist movement wanting to push forward for the helping of, of other Jewish communities in Russia or in Poland where they were victimized. And so it can be both domestic and foreign. Now what's key here then and what the literature has shown is that the stronger people are in their religion or the higher the level of religion religiosity, the more likely they are to engage and participate. So if you have a religious minority group with low levels of religiosity, they're not going to really participate. The demand won't be there. So these things are strongly correlated. Now what about on the supply side? Because why would the parties care? Why would the parties want to reach out to a religious minority? What do they have to gain? What we've seen in American history is that many of these religious minority groups often grow in size. And so because they grow in size or they become uh, dominant in a particular geographical location like the Mormons, political parties will reach out to them and mobilize religious minorities. And this is exactly what you saw where Republicans have mobilized the Mormon uh, church, where before the Republicans, the Mormons had their own political party called the Mormons Pol People's Party. And it wasn't until the 50s and 60s that you saw the Republican Party reach out because Mormons had a critical mass in, in Utah. Um, they have a mass in Republicans in, in, in uh, Idaho, Nevada, and also now starting in Arizona. So they're becoming much more part of the uh, electorate there. Uh, same thing with Democrats mobilizing Catholics and Jews. So you see these alliances that have formed primarily because their numbers have grown. So what I do is I take this uh, framework and I apply it to Muslim Americans, who is probably one of the newest uh, religious minority group and probably one of the groups that we can call unmeltable according to the framework that I've provided here. They say that they, you see all the talk now that they can't fit in, they're not Americans. This is the, the phrase that, there are things that you hear. So is there demand for representation? I think the answer is yes. Uh, post 9-11, uh, the political environment really jump-started Muslim American civic engagement and political participation. The interviews that I've done, um, case studies work often show, my dissertation work shows that Muslim Americans really started to want to get involved in the political system post 9-11 for obvious reasons. You know, there was simply just a great fear among Muslims that, you know, the system was going to turn on them. So they wanted to become a part of it to make sure that they could impede that. However, it's been very difficult for Muslims to become uh, part of the uh, political process. There's a great fear of Muslims. There's a lot of apprehension in the U.S. about Islam. 2002, 2003, 2004, you had many evangelical preachers come out and reject, say, simply reject Islam, saying that there's no place for Islam in our country. And with the latest San Bernardino terrorist attacks that happened, which, by the way, hit very close home to me. I had a, a friend of mine who, who was killed in that attack. And um, it's, been, it's been even even more so, you're hearing more of this come forward. So, and they're viewed with suspicion more than any other religious group in the contemporary era. From the US Patriot Act to the NSEERS Registration Act to direct FBI surveillance at the New York Times uh, exposed in 2011, CA monitoring of Islamic textbooks, they live in what we would call a politically threatened environment. I don't think there's any, any real doubt about that. Um, now, also from the policy side, they are looking for benefits, both domestic and form. The greatest concern, according to Muslim advocacy groups, is civil rights. You know, they constantly feel like their civil rights are being trampled on, and, and for the evidence is strong to suggest that they are. Immigration concerns as well, specifically now with what's been happening um, in the news, uh, especially with uh, refugee resettlement programs. And many people don't realize the great diversity in Islam, how many different you know, ways of understanding Islam. So when you're saying, when Donald J. Trump says, I want to ban all Muslims, he doesn't quite understand, well, what do you mean by Muslims? Who do you mean? There's a great diversity. Are you talking about the Alawite Muslims that are fleeing ISIS? Because they want nothing to do with those folks. Are you talking about the middle class Sunni Muslims who are fleeing to Germany? They want nothing to do with this. I mean, who are you talking about? And just to label them all like that just shows sort of this fear that they're unmeltable. Um, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, if there is one foreign policy issue that could probably unite a diverse Muslim community, it's probably that issue. So there is lots of both a desire for representation, 
because of a political threat and also a desire because of policy benefits. Now, are they religious? Because I mentioned earlier that the level of religiosity matters. And so the more religious a group is, the more likely you're going to see the group coalesce, come together, and uh, ask for benefits or demand representation. And the answer is, yeah, Muslim Americans tend to be pretty religious. They're on par with self-identified Christians. Now, just like most Americans, what you see with Muslim Americans is they're not dogmatic about their religion. What I mean by that is because you see Ahmadiyya Muslims in the US, you see so many different um, variations of Islam. We often don't even say Islam, we often say Islams with an S at the end, just to accommodate the plurality that exists in, in the, not the theological practices, um, though there are some, some, some doctrinal differences, more in just the way that the orthopraxy rather than the orthodoxy. And so because of this, you know, we say, we ask a basic question then in our surveys. You know, how religious are you? And the best way we can understand that is, that do you practice the Salah? Do you pr pray five times a day? And nearly half of Muslims say, yes, they do. And so, you know, you'll see in this next slide here that religion plays a key role in life of all the groups that are there. Uh, Mormons are probably the ones who say that religion matters more than Muslims, uh, followed by Protestants. Um, this would mostly be uh, evangelical Christians. And then Jewish Americans probably have the lowest motivation by religiosity. The literature clearly shows that Jewish Americans are becoming much more secular as, as, as time moves forward. Now, is there a supply of voters? Are there enough Muslim Americans for the parties to want to reach out to? Uh, the argument is yes and eventually yes. W you know, we don't actually know how many Muslim Americans are. Unlike the Canadian census, who, which asks for religion, the US census doesn't allow for religion. It doesn't allow you to ask. And so, but we have seen a dramatic growth in the number of Muslim Americans. We're just not quite sure how. So Smith published an article in 2002 arguing that, the, that there's about 2.3. Muslim, million Muslim Americans. Uh, Muslim advocacy groups like CARE put it at about 7 million, uh, anywhere from 1 to 2% of the population. So according to this, Muslims are or will be the largest religious minority group in the US, perhaps larger than the Jewish population, but for sure we expect the uh, population, barring any changes in policy, uh, to double. And in fact, there's a graph here from the Pew that shows that the United States will probably see the largest percentage increase in Muslim population in, in 20 years, followed by Canada. And so in fact, again, with barring any, uh, with ceteris paribus, all things being equal, with nothing changing in this process. Now, um, given this, what had happened? What's historically happened? Well, Muslim Americans, um, there was a tendency for them to want to become Republican. If you look at Muslim Americans, they have higher levels of education and income. Many of them, 70% of Muslim Americans are foreign born, yet 70% of them, close to 70% of them are, are naturalized as citizens. Which means when you see this in the literature, you see that immigrants who tend to naturalize are those who tend to have the means to naturalize. And so it, you see a lot of Muslims that come over from Pakistan, from India, from Malaysia. They're often educated. They often already have advanced degrees. They're coming over as doctors and engineers on you know, um, F1 visas as students, or on H1B visas, or on E1 visas. These are the visa programs that allow us to bring in talent. Uh, from the opposite side, it's called brain drain. We call it bringing in talent uh, in the US. So they tend to be more socially conservative. Uh, they tend to be more anti-abortion, anti-gay marriage. And, you know, so, the, but the numbers were too small. Republicans never reached out to them because their numbers just were way too small. That changed in the 2000 election with Bush. Bush actually reached out to the Muslim Americans. He was the first major political candidate to get out there and say, how can I mobilize you? And Muslim Americans turned out to vote for Bush in record numbers for a couple of reasons. A, there were tight elections in swing states. The 2000 election in the US is probably one of the closest elections. It is the closest election in American history. Um, the Clinton policy on Jerusalem as an undivided and united capital spurred Muslim Americans to have some kind of policy response. And then finally, uh, it was the uh, Vice President Gore's selection of Joseph Lieberman as his vice presidential running mate, which ended up spurring Muslim Americans to fear that the a Gore administration would be more pro-Israeli than in a Clinton administration. And in turn, Muslim Americans also organized politically. For the first time ever, they formed what was known as the American Muslim Political Coordination Committee, where they could unite their efforts 
to work with the Bush campaign in regards to uh, uh, mobilization. So if you look here in this map, this is uh, 2010, but 2000 holds as well. You'll see concentrations of where Muslim, uh, Muslim congregations and Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, Florida, Virginia, those were all swing states in 2000. So it wasn't the Bush campaign's interest to want to reach out to these voters. Okay, so the 9-11 attacks changed the dynamic. They were quickly abandoned by the Republican Party and the Bush administration. In 2004, they were ignored by the Democratic Party. The Kerry campaign purposefully chose not to reach out. And they were further marginalized in the 2008-2012 elections. Many polls show that many, about 52% of Americans, some polls suggested, believed that Barack Obama was a Muslim or had Muslim beliefs. And so when I interviewed the director of outreach to campaign for Muslim voters from the Obama campaign, he was fired after this poll came out because they wanted nothing to do with the image of Obama being a Muslim. So he was let go for this reason. Um, you see here, just quickly, because I'm running out of time, the partisanship, how it's shifted over time. And what you're seeing is not a shift, some suggesting towards Democrats, but also towards independents and none. So we put a field survey together and where we interviewed folks, and I'll go through this quickly. And what we tried to do is understand what's the predictors of maybe being Republican, but also what's the predictors of having no partisanship, because we were starting to see the descriptive statistics move towards no partisanship. What we saw was in terms of being Republican, linked fate mechanisms where you believed what happens to one Muslim affects what happened to you was a negative predictor of being Republican, as was being foreign born, second generation, from the Al-Sham region, which I can explain later, being African American if you're older and if you're more educated. The only positive indicator of wanting to be Republican is if you were wealthier, at the bottom. Next, we talked about predictor of no party ID, and what we saw was that if you, again, linked faint mechanism, if you follow Islam closely, of religious guidance, or if you've been discriminated against, those were strong predictors of not identifying with any party, be it re Republican or Democrat. And these are the predicted probabilities of, identi of not identifying with any political party. And as you can see, the more religious you are, the more closely you follow Islam, the more likely you are not to identify with any party, which goes against the literature. The literature suggests the more religious you are, the more likely you are to participate, the more likely you are to have a stronger partisan ID. That is not the case with Muslim Americans. It's actually quite the opposite. Um, this is a later survey done by Gallup on political party affiliation. Looking, asking Muslim Americans who they affiliate with or identify with. Notice independent um, affiliated has dropped by 2012. And resident, respondent perception of party friendliness to Muslims, this was by CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, saying who do you think is friendlier? And they see the Democratic Party as being uh, friendlier um, over time. So this is then the last slide. It's quite possible then that Eventually, over time, just like Catholics and Jews and Mormons and Baptists and Quakers, that Muslim Americans may form a traditional coalition, that they may be part of maybe what we call this larger rainbow coalition that often supports Democrats, and that party officials could respond to the policy needs of Muslim Americans. Hillary Clinton has made that very clear in her campaign. She's actually called out Trump, and she's made it clear she wants to address the policy needs of Muslim Americans. Or what could happen? is it's possible that the Democratic Party could just simply ignore Muslim Americans. I mean, Paul Freimer talks about this in his book from 1999 uh, about what we call electoral capture, is where they vote Democrat um, probably because they have no other choice. So if they want to vote, they vote Democrat because the Republican Party is an unappealing alternative. So they're just stuck, they're, they're captured. And Freimer used to, he referred to African Americans in his work and you know, now a lot of us are saying Muslim Americans might just be that another ca electorally captured group. They just have nowhere else to vote except for Democrats. Not that the Democrats actually care what they say or address their needs. So further research is needed to see which way it's going. I think it's too early, actually, to see which way it's going. Uh, I really don't know. And it, a lot of it will depend on the future Democratic administrations. Uh, won't depend on the Republican administrations, for sure. You know, the, there is no future alliance there. You know, non-voting is rational. Yeah. Well, simple, simply said, people may just choose to vote because they see that it's not in their interest to vote, and it's not because they don't care, it's because they don't see, that it doesn't affect them, or they don't see change. So I don't know if that's quite apathy or a strategic choice to just not vote. And so The American Voter by Campbell, that's the classic book from the 60s, that they have, you know, yeah. a series of, uh, trust me, I had to be tested on this stuff, right, on the, the rational non-voter. And I think 
the millennials are rational non-voters, and let me tell you why. Um, frankly, um, they are the ones, I can't speak for Canada, I'm just going to speak for the U.S. They've been the most affected by the Great Recession. They don't have careers, so normally a career, employment, and union affects whether or not you want to vote. Where's their careers? Um, marriage, kids, or marriage-like settings with children. They're not getting married. They're not having children. Um, where they're still living at home. Um, so they don't have the incentive to vote like other generations did, where I'm a, I'm a Generation Xer, I don't know I'm, who's a boomer in here, and who might be from the silent generation, as they call them. And again, these are generations they apply to the US, I don't know if they apply to Canada, but um, where's the incentives for them to vote? So it might just be that you know, in the next decade, as they move out of their parents' house, actually get a career that pays them something, um, get into marriage-like settings, maybe have children, maybe then you'll see more interest in voting. Um, maybe. I don't know. There is cohort effect, right, where you see that even Generation Xers like myself, we still vote at lower levels than the boomers at their age who vote at lower levels than the silent generation at their age. So there is a cohort effect, but, you know, what do they have to vote for? And so, I'm a, you know, strategic, and I, I'm not a pessimist, or nor am I cynical, but I'm just, they, I teach them every day, right? And so millennials tell me, well, why? Why should I bother? And I don't think it's a cynicism as in they hate the system. It's in like, well, it doesn't affect me, right? It's not going to affect me listening to Spotify. It's not going to affect me when I go on Tinder. It's not going to affect me when I'm hanging out with my friends. So why does it matter? But once they get a job, have kids, you know, they start entering and now it matters, they may, they may vote. Maybe. <laughs> I honestly don't know, but, but maybe. That's, that's the trends, I think. And they're just doing it a lot later than all the other generations. And for good reasons. I mean, our, the, the economy's thrashed them in the U.S. You can't blame them. Definitely that's a case in the United States. Um, that was Paul Freimer's book that he talked about how African Americans, every time Democrats, would just go to them and say, vote for us, vote for us, and we'll do this, this, and then they never would follow up. Except for Barack Obama, who actually has made African American issues part of his presidency, which is fueling um, angry white voters. If you look at the recent polls that come out by NBC News, Esquire Magazine, and ABC News, uh, the new term they're using is the angry white voter, white rage. And part of that is because finally you have a president who's addressing concerns from minority communities, and it's really um, angering the majority. And that's the polls. This is, and you can look them up yourself, Google them, don't believe me. You know, um, the polls are very clear about this. That's fueling Trump, that's fueling Cruz. And so, um, they've, yeah, they, they don't care about it. That's been the, the, the tradition in the U.S. But now, now with a candidate that is actually, or a no, president that has addressed it, you're seeing a reaction to this. And so, just food for thought, you know? So yeah, that's been the tradition in the U.S. And now that's not the case with Obama. Will it revert back under a Clinton presidency? I don't know. You know, um, her husband um, didn't do a good job of addressing minority issues you know, not like Obama has. And so, I, I, it's, it's a good question. I don't know if we'll revert back, you know, but this is, this is uh, the consequence when minorities are getting their views heard, the majority feels like they're being marginalized, which is not healthy for democracy, by the way. Minorities should have their views heard, and they should have their policy issues addressed. But if the majority feels like it's at their expense, that creates a lot of drama, and that's what you're seeing right now. And then that's, it's not necessarily a healthy thing. And there needs to be a way to, to address all concerns, you know, issues that could transcend race, you know, like class issues, like poverty issues. And that's not, that's not happening. So yes, I would say that's definitely what you see in the U.S. Not so much with Obama, which is why maybe we're having the issues. And I'm not blaming him either. It's not his fault. He's doing what he thinks is right. It's just the way it's, it's being perceived is, is really what's happening here, or the way it's being spun and sold.